hit it, Phil. Can it be the breeze that fills the trees with rare and magic perfume? Oh, no. It isn't the breeze. It's Jackson time. La, da, da, da. Well, hello again. This is Buck Benny speaking. I am joined by Kathy Fuller Seeley, John Henderson. Hey, John. Hello. And Zach Eastman. Hi. Uh, hey, Zach. <laughs> we are here to chat about Jack Benny, and our most current episode that we're going to talk about is the episode featuring Irene Dunn and Vincent Price. And it's a, a really good one. It's uh, made for based on a, a radio show episode. And it's really similar to it. They didn't change a whole lot between the radio and TV, which I always like kind of to see the radio episodes brought to television. Jack didn't do it as often as I kind of thought he would. And uh, it's, it's always kind of fun having these. So what we're going to do is we're going to present, after we're done chatting about it and introing it, we'll have the uh, TV episode that we'll, it'll go right into. And then after the TV episode, it's going to go into the audio of the radio show so you could compare the two as well for the radio show it was still vincent price but it was claudette colbert that was with him uh which is fun too so yeah let's uh chat about uh, what we thought about the episode and and things uh I'll, I'll start off by just saying um i really enjoyed it i i, I love it when jack is kind of paints himself into a corner and he definitely does in this episode. Uh, usually it's just a couple people that are kind of against Jack. In this, in this case, he gets ended up in a room at one point with three people and all three of them want him not there. And, and he does a great job of, of just kind of seeming oblivious to the fact that no one wants him there. <laughs> and I, I <laughs> always love that. I always love that. So let's go over to uh, John. What, what were your thoughts on this one? Oh, I loved it. I thought it was great. Uh, of course, the uh, the whole the whole skit or whatever you want to call it with yeah. Vincent Price, Irene Dunn, and the director and the butler always mm -hmm. hilarious. I thought that was great. But I really also loved the introduction with the haircut and all that stuff. I yes. thought that was very funny and surprising. Yes. And actually, I I was looking you know back because I kind of remember the the uh, basic premise of this episode. And I was trying to remember where it came from. And I found at least four, maybe five times that Jack did it on the radio. Mm -hmm. uh, first, yeah. October 20th, 1940. This was the Screen Actor Guild program. Yep. And right. It was Claudette Colbert and Basil Rathbone. And mm -hmm. the director was uh, Ernst Lubitsch. Yep, yep, wow. yep. And they Lubitsch do a little joke off. about... Uh, so Jack, when he's being the butler, he does like a, an over-the-top English accent. And uh, Ernst says, you know, don't do the accent so hard. And he says, like, look who's talking or whatever. Yes. Like that. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, yep. And then he does it on a different program on uh, February 27th, 1944. Barbara Stanwyck and Basil Rathbone. And the director is the Casablanca director. Was it Michael Kirk? Michael Kirkies. Michael Kirkies, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. And then it's this uh, the Vincent Price one that uh, that we know from the actual Jack Benny program, February sixth, nineteen forty nine. Claudette Colbert, Vincent Price, and the director is uh, Vince Markle. He's he's a director, I think, on radio, right? Yeah, the Ford Theater. So yeah, right. yeah it's really interesting to see how it changes like it the basics are all there the walnuts and everything but you just see these little changes every time and and i thought it was interesting on the first uh, program you know it's it's a different program it's not just the jack benny program mm -hmm. but they give credit to bill morrow and ed Boulogne for writing the episode so i don't know if they're still getting residuals by the television show uh, but uh. <laughs> I always wondered how that works because so many of their shows, or certainly the premises that they put together, were followed up by other writers, and I never knew if they get anything from uh, that or not. Well, um, Jack has a long history with that um, because um, Harry Kahn actually sued him in about 1938. Uh, saying you've continued to use the characters I created in 1932 and I'd like $100,000. They eventually settled for like $10,000 out of court. But um, it, it does show that uh, from the very beginning, Jack assumed that these were writers for hire. 
and he, he alone owned the uh, owned the intellectual right. property of the scripts. So and um, frankly, I, that might have changed for, uh, by the time of television. Might have made it a lot more complicated. But at least on radio, that's. But how you would we think if they were getting any residuals, any money off of it, that it would mention their names in the somehow in the credits would have said as developed yeah. by yeah. Beloit and Morrow but, or something. So it no. makes me think they probably weren't getting any money at that point. I don't yeah. know. Well, no, I'm a bit keeping in mind too that Morrow and Beloit, from what I, if I'm remembering my history correctly, they didn't leave on bad terms the way Harry Kahn left. No. Uh, right, right. And, but they still didn't get paid. So No, they didn't. But Jack took care of them. I mean, I'm not. I'm not excusing it. But believe me, residuals are a thing that should be earned. But um, uh, he also brought them into several different writing gigs outside of radio, whether it was film right. or public appearances. And by the time that they left, they had found other gigs. So I don't. I, I wonder if Marlon and Boulogne just didn't really think to ask. <laughs> um. But also remember that no one, that the script's one thing, no one was ever going to hear these live performances again. Right. So there was no sense of uh, residuals from the performance. True. Yeah, so, it's, it's, like I, said, I think they, back in the day, um, they just weren't thinking that way because mm -hmm. it was going to be live and gone, live and gone. And it's, you know, um, it's it's not till uh, he's got the, the four writers that they start going back to the old scripts and, and digging in. So it's, uh, it's it, it would the, be handled very differently today. Yeah, it's like one of the reasons why if Jack does uh, has the episode where Bing Crosby says hell, he's not going to get too penalized for it because nobody's going to hear it again. Whereas right. in an era like Janet Jackson and the Super Bowl fiasco, that, that, that detriments her career because that has an instant replay situation going on combined with news coverage so like you know there's that they thought of this as nothing more than the than the play of the week and then they toss the scripts in the garbage unless you right. bill harris where he's like i saved everything i picked up off the floor so, so are you saying zach that people were replaying that scene of janet jackson over and over again <laughs> It's an example. Uh, oh my gosh! I didn't even know you can play it. I just knew you could steal it and look at it, and that that yeah, that's you know, it's not not that I would do that, but uh, you, know. you can use the Will Smith slap from la this year, earlier last year with uh, for a modern example like that. That's something that has the that has the coverage that something like Bing Crosby saying hell isn't necessarily going to pertain, and also that's in an era where you could feasibly pay off the journalists to not make it a big deal. <laughs> like I'm just thankful he didn't slap Janet Jackson. That would have been horrible. So if you well. think about the the way that technology has changed since this time, it's interesting to hear Jack Benny say, you know, uh, the gossip columnists, let me see the latest thing. Oh, Jack Benny is getting a haircut. What? That's absurd. But nowadays you actually could go on Twitter and somebody could report, a gossip columnist could report, oh, this celebrity is at this location right now doing this. Yeah. yeah. Certainly I've watched a few episodes over time because my kids would have it on or something of TMZ. And yeah. that is a, it's that kind of thing you hear on TMZ. It's it, this bizarre things where they happen to find a celebrity somewhere at, at, at a donut shop or something and <laughs> and then just uh, talk about the, the, uh, them being at this donut shop. I don't think they've ever gone there before. Have you gone to that donut shop? I don't know. <laughs> it's like, no. Yeah. Really, there yeah. must be something better to talk about. But yeah, no. I've got Jack over on uh, Crenshaw Boulevard, and his Maxwell is completely stopped, and it just says Jack. <laughs> 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 you can't put it. Exactly. Oh, That's crazy, crazy. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's, uh, let's go over to... Uh, uh, Kathy, what were your thoughts on this episode? Well, what did you... I, I absolutely adore this episode. And thank you very much, John, for doing the archaeology of all the different times that have been used. And Jack was so smart, Jack and his writers and producers, to have it be, uh, you know, not always on his own show. That was, I must go find the Ernst Lubitsch one. Uh, uh, if you have just the... Just for how fun. If it's, you have uh, it's available at thisdaybenny.com. Mm -hmm. Want to check it out? <laughs> yeah, and if you and if you have the criterion of to be or not to be, it's an extra on there as well. Oh. Yeah, oh, fantastic! So, wow. Yeah. Hey, John, well, how's how's the sound quality on that one? Do you know? Oh, it's good. It's yeah. pretty good. 
Is it good? Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I'll present that one because I kind of like the the idea of Lubitsch being in there, and it, cool. and the fact that it was the first one. So maybe I'll swing that one after this show instead of uh, the other one I was going to. So. Yeah. Well, they're they're all good, but but it it does make one of the sort of best all around Benny skits. And just as, as you all have said, it's it's amazing that that he's at his most um I won't don't want to say despicable, most um, you know, annoying. Uh yes. his character is and and you know, at sort of at a far point of being uh obnoxious, and yet it works so well. And um uh, no wonder he could get his friends, these fabulous actresses and and actors to do it because the whole skit makes them look um you know better nothing yes. more fun than making fun of jack benny right. so uh um, yeah it's, it's a great skit uh yeah uh, vincent that, price yeah. just does such a nice job on this episode is is acting and just really seeming like he's put out with jack and upset with jack i mean he he really brings that across nicely and yeah. and of course the more the more you do that as an actor, the more it makes Jack's performance stand out and 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 builds on Jack. If you, if you yeah. are uncomfortable with that and then treat it lightly, it it kind of pulls away and 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 it doesn't give you that edge that you need to really make Jack shine. Because because Jack is, I I don't know how he does it. It's it's very difficult to do. I guess Steve Carroll today does a pretty good job of this too. Is coming off as a jerk and yet being lovable at the same time and where you where you as an audience you just enjoy it and you just think it's funny and where i would be afraid if i'm writing this that you'd go oh am i am i, am I gonna make people not like yeah that? am i gonna make them am, am i pushing it too hard and as far as i can tell you can't push it too hard it's like it's like phil's character where they just keep dumping more stuff on him and making him a womanizer and making him an alcoholic and all these things. And it just makes the character more lovable and more fun and, and uh, uh, the audience deals with it. That, that's great for, for those out in the audience who it's worthwhile to stick around or or to at least fast forward and to find, um, to compare the radio to the video version of what happens in the, in Irene, in the movie star's home. Uh, because what I, I love to do with my college students is play those two things back to back. Um, I start with the radio one and then go to the television one. Um, and the students then become really aware of uh, how uh, Jack is, an, um, we don't often give him as much credit as he is due for a visual performer, a visual comedian, because mm -hmm. the subtle ways in which they adapted the script to to play up the looking at each other to play up that you know so much of it is the same but the way they reblocked it i don't know how much uh, uh you'll see of uh, as yeah. uh, uh jack ends up literally in the middle yeah. of, of vincent price and irene dunn yes. arguing it's, yeah. it's brilliant and something that you would never have known on radio Correct. but it just you know there are marvelous ways in which they found um uh, new ways of doing the humor mm -hmm. And and some visual stuff with the the nuts is such a great part of this because he does such a good job of of bringing in the nuts at different times and you can definitely in your head even though you haven't listened to the radio show necessarily figure out oh yeah you'd hear cracking and everything of nuts and so forth mm -hmm. which which could be funny but there's visuals he does with the nuts too that are really good too that that we couldn't do in radio. Zach, what you was, uh, on this, on I was really program. impressed with Vincent Price because well, I know him from things like The Fly and The House of Wax and things like yeah. that. And so this is really a, t a totally different side of him. He's really playing the dramatic <laughs> actor and he does really well too. But yeah. he's also able to play the, the behind the scenes version of himself, just yeah. being annoyed with Jack. And, uh, and I think he even pulls off the, the bit about grammar even better than Basil Rathbone. Like he really makes it seem natural, and uh, and so I thought it was great. Well, and I think for an actor like Vincent, I would, if I was him, I'd be going, "Wow, this is great!" Because it'll get me seen by a whole bunch of people, and maybe instead of just seeing me in the horror genre, somebody out there will go, "Hey, maybe I can put him in this other movie or something," and and That's broaden funny. his appeal. I'm sure, because every person that I ever hear interviewed that's like a Vincent, where they're sort of 
have a uh, are kind of pigeonholed in a certain area are always hoping that someone will see that they can do more than that. Uh, well, I think, though I think they're thankful for all the incredible work they get because Vincent really did uh, a lot of work in in that field uh, of horror and, and, and that sort of thing. That he, and he made that a conscious choice. He had yeah. a choice. When he got offered House of Wax, he basically made a choice. He knew the choice he was making because if you could, well, you could go back and watch a movie like The Web or Laura, you know, he had the, the potential to to move more into the the legitimate drama. Right. And he made it around the time that this episode came out to just basically kind of stick where the money is because he had other hobbies outside of acting. I mean, his paint, uh, his collection of paintings is notoriously uh, his uh, cooking. His cooking, his yeah. Enjoyment of gourmet food. So exactly. So it's you know, if you want, if you want good taste, sometimes you got to engage in bad taste. I guess yeah. uh, is his philosophy. Oh, well, and he really embraced it. Like you see him later in the seventies, like on the Muppet Show, and he's just like, yeah, just sort of spoofing himself and embracing this sort of thing right. he's become. Yeah. Or on the the Brady Bunch, the episode where they go to Hawaii, he's in that and and does a good job in that too, which is and, and, and <laughs> playing the creepy guy that lives in the cave sort of thing. So. <laughs> I even just appreciated in the Benny show how they were able to use the um the fact that he's so tall to make Benny look you know even yes. smaller and more you know kind of obnoxious. So. Um, mm. And so, how Jack it, just just comes across as thinking he's better than Vincent in every way, and and and, and uh, obviously you're like, okay, he is not the leading man material that Vincent is, and, and yet Jack is like, oh no no, I'm certainly the better choice, you know, so forth. Yeah, um, Zach, what are your thoughts on it? Um, it's uh, it, there's, it, I, I think it was. Uh, there was a point brought up just a minute ago about like. This is Jack and it's most intolerable. And I and I I, I want to speak to that effect because it's it's I, I I love using modern analogy. This is the equivalent of George Costanza having his fiance lick the envelopes that are clearly poisoned, or Cartman in the Scott Tennerman episode of South Park, where this is the this is an episode where if you've been listening to Benny and you watch this and you're turned off by his behavior, it could just make you shut down, or it's like it's your make or break. It's like the ultimate skit of Jack being the absolute worst, yes. and there is a absolute value to it. And the only reason that it separates itself from those first two examples or any Larry David show that's come out, it it boils down to that he built up trust in the audience for 10 years or eight years prior to that. And they already know that he would do that. It just seems like the most extreme version. If you're looking at it as a, like a, a slight observer of Jack, but it is like a, it's a, um, a Testament episode to what the Jack Benny character is supposed to be. Um, I will tell you that this is one of the also the most accessible episodes that has ever existed, partially because Irene Dunn and Vincent Price are in it. My one of my co-hosts on Real Nerds, Brian, uh, I tried to get him to watch Jack Benny for years. And he and he had said he had seen like one or two things, but he couldn't remember anything. But he got really into Irene Dunn within the last two years. And he texted me one day and he said, I'm watching my first episode of the Jack Benny program, and it was the Irene Dunn episode. And he could not stop giggling at the line the word is best there are only two of us drinking it <laughs> yes yes uh, oh, that is, is so funny that that callback to that and the setup yeah. of it and everything and it's it's perfect and it's a, jack and it's a great example of that vanity and and playing on the dramatic tropes that that existed in in any form of medium at that time it's it's a great knocking down posterity that Morrow and Boulogne were good at and then was repurposed according to the needs of the newer writers that came in. It's just a really well-rounded sketch. You could conceivably do this with another comedian as well if you wanted to. It wouldn't be the same that Jack did, but like if you got Bob Newhart to maybe do this, um, or like I'm trying to think of somebody that plays a more vainglorious thing. Conceivably, you could get Milton Berle to do this because uh, it is just a very well-written comedy sketch. Um, does that mean that they'll do it as well as Jack? Absolutely not. But 
the framework is there to make a wonderful, a wonderfully awkward situation even more awkward. And Jack is fueling it with that, with that awkwardness. He's really good at fueling every sketch that his writers come up with, with the added benefit of his performance that just creates an awkward situation for virtually everybody in the room. It's like the Jack Well, or the it's like the episode where he goes to the Coleman's for dinner. It's the same situation. Oh. He, if it's not, if it weren't for him, it wouldn't hit the same way, but he's just making it 10 times more awkward than it has to be. Well, uh, and you're right that it's sort of like, it's sort of a similar thing with Larry David, like you mentioned, where it's like, he does something that would be considered socially inappropriate. And mm -hmm. the reason that it goes so far is because everyone else is trying to be polite. They're trying yeah. to let him down gently. And then <laughs> it just, if they had just said it at the beginning, no, no way, they would have stopped there. But they're trying to like, they're trying to let him down gently and he just won't receive it. <laughs> and, similar, and similar to David and Seinfeld, you know, Jack kept pushing the boundary of what his audience would accept and not accept. Uh, not to the same points that Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld did, but did you, if, if you're looking for the 50s or 60s equivalent on the television show especially, there are moments where he pushes every single one of his jokes to the, like the Johnny Carson episode where he's like, how does he say so young? And it just turns out he's a, a robot. <laughs> like, that, <laughs> like That is just like, let's just see how far we can go. We're on television now. Let's just push it to the absolute minimum or a maximum. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's just one of the most accessible episodes. I'd put this in the top 10 if I was like doing a critical analysis on the Jack Benny program as a television show. It's not one of my personal favorites. But it is objectively one of the best episodes that has ever come out of that program. Not even a question. Agreed. Agreed. And, and folks are in for a, a real treat here. Uh, Kathy, maybe you can uh, well, read to us a little of the, the variety review of this. Well, I, I was delighted to find this uh, uh, review. Um, and I was partic uh, particularly interested because um, Variety's reviewers had really harshed on Jack's TV performances. Um, from the ones I've been reading, they didn't like it. It wasn't fast enough. It wasn't visual enough. It, you know, so but they really changed their tune. Now um, uh, they turns out they loved the Johnny Ray episode um, that that you that will be in your series earlier. Um, and then um, they loved uh, his appearance uh, uh, a week before this in uh, a Sunday afternoon show, Omnibus, where he did a cut down, a 53 minute version of his film, The Horn Blows at Midnight. So um, the reviewer is especially kind here. And um, they're going to, the reviewer is going to emphasize that this is one of the first ones that filmed, that's filmed. Now I'll have to go back and check because certainly there must have been previous ones that were filmed, but um, the reviewer is going to say that in a way that's very prescient, I'm so glad that this one will be available to slot in if there's ever a problem or that could be seen over and over again. So uh -huh. sort of a, an odd backwards comment about how good this one is. So if you don't mind, I'll read really quickly because it's interesting. It appeared on December 9th, 1953. With anyone else but Jack Benny, they would have said he got lucky. Two socceroos in a row, Sundays on end, is an event reserved for the great. Those who rated his horn blows at midnight on Omnibus as the super of his TV career may now have revised their thinking. What passed this reviewing stand can't get any worse than a photo finish. Playing it close to the belt, it was the year's comedy standout in what may be TV's biggest comedy year, 1953. In this first filming for the Luckies series, Jack Benny proved indubitably that all the spontaneity of the live show can be preserved in the tinned concept. Not only that, but for the added plusage, good old variety language, plusage, <laughs> It could also be in the forefront of anything he's ever done on TV. Agreeing with you, Zach, good, better, or best, as the mood of variable dictates, it hit the top strata and stayed there. If memory serves, early in his TV career, he tried a similar tack of storyline comedy with Claudette Colbert and Robert Montgomery, and it scored mightily. I like this early in his TV career. Um, radio? Hmm? Uh... Only the skeleton plot was retained, but with Irene Dunn, Gregory Radoff, Vincent Price, and a butler named Rex Evans uh, as co-protagonists, it bagged more laughs of anyone, nope, it bagged more laughs than the limit allows. 
in the hands of anyone less skilled in the delicate comedy nuances, commonly called touches, it would have played like a dozen others. But with Benny and his polished helpers, it was a classical gem of, at of atomic humor. Atomic. It, the situation called for Benny to dislodge Price as Miss Dunn's leading man over Ratoff's protest. That and little more, but but with Benny supplying the filling, it made the big difference. From his writing staff of four, he got literary lace in his idiom, and at the tiller, charting the course through high waves of hilarity was Ralph Levy and Hilliard Marks, but crafty as they come in the comedy field. Just to pick one gag from the laugh-packed script, Banny tagged off his curtain speech by welcoming a new station in Las Vegas to the network. When he fumbled with the call letters, a voice from the stage stopped him. Sorry, folks, poker face Benny said. They just lost it. Now, you can tell me, what the heck are they talking about? It was Benny at his holiday best, and every line and business glove fitted to his particular traits of ringing laughs from every word and gesture. Miss Dunn was capitally correct, and to borrow from Luella Parsons, uh, never looked lovelier. The sputtering, excitable Radoff was an excellent foil for Benny's ambitions and Price the exemplar of suavity, driven to outbursts of, of bad temper. Evans as the butler supplied those little cameos of starched wit that helped make a show. Luckily for Luckies, this one was on film. It'll be around many times again, and the standby for any emergency or just plain reprising because it's just plain so howling good. So they, so a long, back in the day when um, Benny was on so infrequently that every appearance was kind of a special event. So for a change, Variety now loves what Benny does. So Well, I just, I just looked uh, up in the uh, Internet Movie Database. Uh, uh -huh. There was an episode, April 1st, 1951, that we don't have anymore. Claudette Colbert, Basil Rathbone, Robert Montgomery. So since Robert Montgomery was doing his television show, he was probably taking the yep. director role. Yes. And, uh -huh. uh, so they did it again. So Yeah. yeah. I guess he likes this one because he did it many, many times. Many, so many when times. you get something that works, you just do it. But, you know, unlike today, people would only have their memories. They they wouldn't have it Correct. to just go find and watch over and over and over again on, on YouTube. So I guess you could stretch yeah. a favorite bit out. Well, I'm glad they approached it that way with Variety and talked about it. That was a really good review. Thank you. Because um, they could have easily gone the other way if they wanted to as a writer and say, Oh my gosh, how many times does he have to redo this yeah. thing over and over again? We've seen it in 1951, we saw it in 1940, we, I mean, we heard it in 1940, we heard it in the, right? So they could go into big lengths. Um, I think he might even redo this whole thing on Shower uh, of Stars, and one of the Shower of Stars later on, we'll have to see. Um, I know that there's an episode that has been some price in it and so forth, and I assume it might be a redo of this same thing but i haven't watched that one yet so we'll have to check that out and see if they, they revisit it or if they pad it more by having it be an hour long performance i, I also know. thought it was interesting this being a, a filmed episode and i guess the first filmed episode they must have done a live audience watching it to get the laugh track and you'll notice that he doesn't pause for the audience laughing like he might normally they're laughing on top of him and sometimes they're catching up so yeah it's interesting that they had the filmed episode but then it's not like your you know modern sitcom of the 90s or whatever yeah. where they're they're canning the laughter and they're calculating exactly where the laughs should be mm -hmm. but they're just letting the audience go for it right yeah and uh speaking of that the uh since this is a filmed episode the quality of it at least the visual quality is higher than we've been presenting so with the, a lot of the lives so that's mm -hmm. kind of nice to see a, a clear looking episode and everything um this has to be i would think one of the earlier filmed episodes i, I don't know how early he was filming but um, most of them so far have been live, as far as I can tell, that we've been talking about. So this might be, be the first there's one. There's a point I I was listening back to an interview that Laura Leibowitz did um, about the television series, and I guess at some point they were they were testing the waters, so they alternated. One week would be live, and then the next week would be filmed. So I I would imagine that this is in the early stages. 
of, yes. of them alternating between. But you can tell that the directors are already aware of like, all right, if, if we're going to film this one, then we're going to add value to it because the shot selection is 10 times more engaging than your typical live setup. Yes. Uh, it's also another example of like how Jack works the best in a medium or a wide um, or like a medium close up. Um, like whenever they cut away to him cracking the walnuts and stuff like that, that stuff just works better for Jack. Um, I've looked at, I've compared it to the later television shows, like in the sixties, every time they cut away to a close up of Jack and those, and those, it doesn't work because they're just lingering too long on either the previous thing. And they're not allowing him to react to anything here. You're actually watching him engage with every performer that's around him. And it's that's that that's an energy you can only feel when it's being well directed and well blocked. Um, so it's 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 remarkable to watch them doing it this early in in the stages of television too, especially. For sure. Great. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you guys are in for a real treat. Uh, I guess we'll get to it and and go ahead and play the episode, and then and then you'll have one of the radio episodes. I haven't decided which one. It'll be a surprise for you. There you go. But. <laughs> Uh, I'm leaning towards the Lubitsch one. We'll, we'll have to see. Um, anyway, uh, any th any last words anybody has? Or are we good? Do we cover everything you think? Uh, the word is best. That's the only way to leave this. Episode. <laughs> best. <laughs> oh no! But this this, this truly is one of his bestest episodes ever. So yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, when can I use that version? I don't know. Anyway, uh, off we go. <laughs> Enjoy. See you guys next time. Thanks, everybody. The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. What do you think this is? It looks like some form of torture machine, doesn't it? Far from it. Actually, this instrument has a lot to do with a better taste of Lucky Strike cigarettes. What you were just looking at was a device for measuring the moisture content of tobacco about to be made into cigarettes in a Lucky Strike manufacturing plant. And believe me, smoking enjoyment depends a lot on maintaining proper moisture content. Too much moisture and your cigarette will burn too slow. Too little and it will taste dry. That's why the American Tobacco Company keeps a sharp eye on the moisture content of the fine tobacco that goes into every Lucky during every step of its manufacture. Here's how Robert Pendleton, who operates the instrument you just saw, tests for moisture after the tobacco has been shredded. He pushes a container of tobacco under the specially designed moisture meter. The long prongs bury deep into the tobacco. Then electric impulses show the moisture content of that tobacco on a dial. Yes, the fine tobacco that goes into every Lucky gets a lot of expert attention all along the line. The moisture test is just one of the hundreds of quality controls regularly made to be sure that you get all the better taste of Lucky's fine tobacco. For smoking enjoyment is all a matter of taste. And the fact of the matter is, Lucky's taste better, cleaner, fresher, smoother. So be happy. Go Lucky. Thanks, it's okay. Next. Your next, sir. Where, um, where's the other barber, the tall fellow? Uh, he just went out to lunch, sir. Anything I can do? Well, he, uh, I don't know. You see, he gave me a haircut and he left it a little bit too long in the back. <laughs> Sit down, sir. Thank you. You made a charge for this, will No, no, of course not. By the way, when did the other barber cut your hair? About four weeks ago. <laughs> okay, Mr. Dunny. Oh, you, you know who I am? Now, yes. <laughs> See, these Hollywood columnists are really wonderful. You can't make a move without them knowing about it. 
Listen to this. Uh, Tyrone Power is winding up another picture in Italy. Errol Flynn is leaving with camera crew for Australia. Jack Benny is in Beverly Hills getting a haircut. <laughs> Gregory Rathoff, director, has completed casting his new production. This picture will star Irene Dunn and Vincent Price. Gosh, I'd like to make a picture with Irene Dunn sometime. That's funny. When I was having lunch with Gregory Rathoff the other day in the Brown Derby, he didn't even mention it. And we're such good friends, too. I can't understand why he didn't ask me to play the part instead of Vincent Price. <laughs> Hello? Yes? This is Gregory Rado. Oh, hello, Vincent. Hello, how are you? Yeah, yeah, we were host tonight. Yeah, at Irene Don's house. That's right, Vincent. See you there. Bye. Yes? Mr. Jack Benny's here to see you. Jack Benny? I don't remember having an appointment for him today. What does he want? Perhaps you're to have lunch with him. Oh, no. That I'll never do again. You know, last week we had lunch together at Brown Derby, and the most embarrassing thing has happened. There was some food left after lunch, and Jack Benny called the waiter and asked him for a paper bag to take the food back home to his dog. Well, Mr. Ratoff, lots of people take food home to their dogs. Noodle soup? Ratoff will see you now. Hello, Jackie. Hello, Gregory. How are you? Well, sit down, my boy. Sit Thank down. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to what do I owe this extreme pleasure? Well, uh, Gregory, uh, I know you're a very busy man, so I won't take up much of your time. But I, um, I have some wonderful news for you. Yeah? What, what is it? Well, this morning, I got a haircut. Well, congratulations. <laughs> That's not what I mean. See, while I was sitting in the barber chair, I read in the paper that you're going to make a picture with uh, Irene Dunn and Vincent Price. That's right, Jackie. And it's going to be wonderful. I consider myself very fortunate with this casting. Mm -hmm. Well, what is this you wanted to talk to me about? Well, uh, Gregory, I was just wondering if uh, you'd uh, like to use me instead of Vincent Price. <laughs> Getting back to the picture, uh, of course, I don't want you to think this is anything personal, but I feel that I would do a much better job for you than Vincent Price. Look here, Jack, you don't mind if I ask you something? No, no, no. Uh, didn't you do uh, personal appearances last spring? Yes, yes, I did. And didn't you go on an extensive tour of one-night stands last summer? That's right, that's right. Now, if I remember correctly, you've been on the radio for about 20 years. 20 years on the radio, yes. And now you have your own television show. My own television show, that's right. Well, let somebody else make a buck, will you? <laughs> that's not the point. It's a matter of proper casting. Now, does Miss Dunn know that you have bits and price? She picked him. Oh. Well, Gregory, you being the director, don't you think it would be better? No. <laughs> well, look, Gregory, you see, it's all right to be artistic, you know, but you, uh, you have to be practical about these things. Now, if, if you give me the job, I can save you money. You can? Yeah. You see, not only am I a great actor, you see, but when you score the picture, I can sit in the orchestra because I also play the violin. See? So uh, by my taking two jobs at the same salary, I'll be beating Vincent's price. <laughs> the chair turned over. How did that happen? I don't know. Only my stomach did the same thing. Now. Look here, Jack. Yeah. There's nothing personal against you. 
But Mr. Price is engaged for the role, and that settles it. Well, it doesn't settle it with me, Mr. Ratoff. I'm going to call Miss Dunn and take the matter up with her directly. I wish you would. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Ratoff. <laughs> Irene Dunn, Crestview 54124, Crestview 54124, Crestview 54124. What number were you dialing? Crestview 54124. I'm sorry, but Bradshaw 2, 2199 has been changed to Sycamore 2, 8002. Sycamore 2, 8002. Sycamore 2, 8002. Sycamore 2, 8002 has just been changed back to Crestview 5, 4124. Look, well, operator, that's the number I called in the first place. Just a moment, operator. Hello. I'd like to speak to Miss Irene Dunn, please. This is Miss Dunn speaking. Irene, this is Jack Bennett. Oh, hello, Jack. It's nice to hear your voice. The last time you called me was in 1943. 1943? Yes, don't you remember? You wanted me to play opposite you in The Horn Blows at Midnight. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Jack, did they ever make that picture? Well, of course they made the picture. And it did great business, too. We played uh, eight weeks at Lowe's Belgian Congo. <laughs> Pakistan, and 16 weeks at Grauman's Chinese. The original one, you know, at Quang Cho Fu. Now, Irene, uh, the reason I called you is, uh, you see, Gregory Ratoff just talked to me about the picture that you're going to make. Talk to you? Uh-huh, and although he was rather subtle about it, he suggested that I play the part of your husband. But I thought Vincent Price was set for that part. Well, he was scheduled to, but... Uh, if you want me, all you have to do is speak up. <laughs> Irene, I said, all you have to do is speak up. Irene? Irene? Hello? Hello? Joe Fish Market. <laughs> Sadie the Scaler speaking. It is not. I've been out with Sadie and I know her voice. <laughs> That number has been changed to Webster all time. Later, get off the line. I will, if you'll deposit ten cents for an additional three minutes. Already? Gee, it doesn't seem like we've been talking three minutes, does it, Irene? You ought to be on this end. What? You ought to be in the middle. <laughs> Now, Irene, Irene, to get to the point, when do you start rehearsing? Well, tonight at my house, but, but I don't think you ought to. Uh, at your house? Uh, oh, what time? Eight o'clock. But really, Jack, I don't think you ought to. Eight o'clock, huh? Well, I'll be there, Irene. I'll tell you what. I'll read the part, and Vincent Price will read the part, and may the best man win. I certainly hope so. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, Irene, should I come for dinner? <laughs>
Hmm. You've got a minute left, and nobody will talk to me. <laughs> early so I can go over the script. While Jack is on his way to Miss Dunn's home, I'd like a word with you about Lucky Strike. As you know, friends, your enjoyment of a cigarette depends on its taste. And Lucky's taste better. Here's why. Lucky's are made better to taste better. They're made round and firm and fully packed to draw freely and smoke evenly. And L-S-M-F-T, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So for all the deep down smoking enjoyment you want from your cigarette, be happy. Go lucky. Next time, ask for a carton of better tasting Lucky Strike. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we take you to the home of Miss Irene Dunn. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Price. Hello, Gordon. Make yourself comfortable, sir. Miss Dunn will be down in a few moments. Thank you. May I mix you a drink? No, thank you. Oh, excuse me. Uh, yes, sir? Uh, I'm Jack Benny. Miss Dunn is expecting me. Oh, won't you come in? Thank you. May I take your coat, sir? Oh, yes, yes. And your hat? Oh, oh. <laughs> well, Mr. Vincent Price. I'm Jack Benny, star of stage, screen, radio, and television. How do you do? <laughs> So the two rivals meet, eh? Rivals? What do you mean? Well, I guess I should have let Irene tell you, but uh, it looks as though I'm going to take your place in this picture. You're taking my place? Oh, that's ridiculous, old boy. Oh, no, it isn't. You see, at rehearsal tonight, you and I are both going to read the parts, and uh, the best man will win. The uh, best man? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Benny, when two people are involved in a statement, the comparative is used. You don't say the best man will win, you say the better man will win. Oh. But when three or more people are involved, then the word best is the correct adjective. I see. So before we compete for this part, Mr. Benny, it might be well if you first learned to speak English. <laughs> Well, for your information, Mr. Price, I went to Waukegan High School and excelled in English. I got 99 every single term. Well, ain't that ginger peachy. Now, cut that out. Of all the sore losers, you certainly take the cake. Hello, Gordon. How do you do, Mr. Rello? Hello, Weems. Oh, hello, Gregory. Well, hello, Gregory. What are you doing here? Well, I just thought I'd come Gregory, around. I don't know what this is all about, and I demand an explanation. Am I or am I not appearing opposite Miss Dunn? Well, of course you are. Well, then what is this Schlemiel talking about? <laughs> Schlemiel? Yes, S-H-L-E. I know how to spell it. <laughs> I didn't get 99 in English for nothing. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Oh, hello. Oh, hello, Eddie. Gregory, Vincent. Hello. Well, everybody's here, I guess. Yes, everybody. <laughs> Some coffee, Gregory? No, thank you, Eddie. Vincent? Yes, please. Oh, I'll have a cup. <laughs> Price. Thank you. Mr. Benny. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> mm. Gee, Irene, this is the better coffee I ever tasted. <laughs> the word is best. There are only two of us drinking. <laughs> the comparative. Well, let's get on with the contest, shall we? I mean, the rehearsal. Uh, Gordon, take this tray, please. 
Gregory, before we begin this rehearsal, let's settle one thing for Mr. Benny's benefit. Is he or is he not replacing me in this picture? Certainly not. This is ridiculous. Of course it's ridiculous. I think it's absurd. You can... <laughs> Stick out the dishes like Miss Dunn told you. All right, all right. Now let's get on with the rehearsal. Look here, Jack. If you insist on staying, just keep quiet and sit down over here. All right. Now look here, Irene, honey child. We will start with the scene that takes place in the drawing room. Oh, Irene, is it all right if I have some of these walnuts here? Oh, help yourself, Dad. Yes, it's a big one. As I said, we will start with the scene that takes place in the drawing room. <laughs> that was a tough one. Uh, uh, look, Irene, in this scene, your husband is late for dinner for two hours. God! <laughs> Well, Irene said I could. Anyway, I don't want to sit here like a bump on a log. If I can't play the leading role, isn't there something I can do? All right. You can play the butler. The butler? Yeah, here is the script. We start on page 12. All right. Look, Irene, you are the wife, and Vincent is the husband that doesn't understand. And Jack, I'm the butler whom Irene really loves. You're the butler, that's all. <laughs> And please stop rewriting the script. Irene is not in love with you. Irene is in love with Winston. And you're just the butler, that's all. <laughs> Don't shout at me. You know, I'm old enough to be your brother. <laughs> uh, Winston, dear, would you please make your rentals from there? Hmm. Irene, honey, look. He's late for dinner for two hours. You're very nervous. So will you please stop from here? Uh, where, where should I go? Oh, go any place. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> oh, Smedley, Smedley. Smedley. <laughs> what is it, madame? Are you sure my husband hasn't phoned? I'm quite sure, madame. Shall I serve? Dinner? <laughs> no, I'm much too upset to eat. I've been under such tension these last few weeks. Oh, why does my husband treat me like this? Why does he act hey, Winston, so... Winston, Winston, that's where you're making your entrance. Okay. Oh, good evening, darling. Sorry I'm so late. Oh, Michael, you're always late and you're always sorry. It's been like this for months. What's come between us? It's nothing, my dear. It's just that I've been so busy lately at the office. Oh. Now, let's forget about it. Come here and give me a little kiss. Dinner is served. <laughs> <laughs> I came in too soon, dear. <laughs> I'm sorry, Grandma. Now, if you don't come in for a few minutes more, will you please sit down? And see me, darling. How much longer? Michael, I, I just can't kiss you and forget it. This can't go on forever. Every night it's the same argument, this constant nagging, nagging, nagging. I tell you, I've been working at the office. But I telephoned your office. They said you left at two this afternoon. Well, I had business at the bank. Michael, you were not at the bank and you know it. All right, so I wasn't. Must I explain my every move to you? <laughs> There's a worm in this one. Look at the way it wiggles. Yeah. And please get away from those dogs. I'm sorry, darling. Please continue. Oh, it's no use, Michael. I know you're lying. Look at you. Everything you say, everything you do gives you away. Well, you can keep on talking. I'm going to have dinner. But, Michael, I must know. Do you love me or not? Of course I love you. You're lying. Really, well, then I am lying. You might as well know the truth, my dear. I've never loved you. Never. Michael, and if you weren't so stupid, you, you would have known it long ago. What are you saying? I married you for your money, that's all. No, Michael. Everybody else has known it. And if you weren't such a blind little fool, Stop, you would have Michael. realized it yourself. No. And the sooner you divorce me, the happier I no, will be. No, Michael. No, no. Here, here, stop these that. dramatics. I'm leaving. Michael. I'm going to my club. <laughs> Smedley, pack my clothes. I wouldn't touch your dirty clothes. <laughs>
You flamingo? He isn't in the streets. Well, I can't help it. He made Irene cry. But he's supposed to make me cry. It's in the story. Well, if that's the kind of a picture it is, I don't even want to be in it. Who asked you to be in it? Irene did. I did not. Well, somebody did. I'm here. <laughs> Look here, Irene. I've never directed before under such aggravating circumstances, and I'll never direct under such aggravating circumstances again. I'm quitting. <laughs> Now do you see what you've done, you blunderhead? <laughs> well, wait a minute. There's no need for everybody to get excited. Look, I'll tell you what, Vincent. Or may I call you Vince? You may call me Mr. Price. Oh. <laughs> Look, Mr. Price. Look, there's nothing to worry about now because, you see, I can direct the picture. Oh, so now you're going to do it. Yeah. I'm sorry, Irene, but I've had enough of this, too. I'm leaving. <laughs> Well, he's gone. Yes, Jack, and I hope you're satisfied. Oh, I am, I am. Of course, I didn't want to get Vincent's part by default. Mm. <laughs> I thought Irina was very, very clever the way you maneuvered it. The way I... <laughs> Why, you... you... um... Schlemiel? <laughs> yes, that's it. I quit, too. <laughs> Well, I've never been so insulted in all my life. <laughs> Gordon, my hat and coat. I wouldn't touch your dirty clothes. <laughs> you might as well go home. Jack, we'll be back in just a moment, but first... Friends, here's a wonderful Christmas gift for anyone who smokes. Because it says, Merry Christmas and Happy Smoking 200 times. Yes, 10 packs of those better tasting Luckies. All done up for Christmas in a beautiful carton created just for Lucky Strike by the famous designer, Mr. Raymond Loy. It'll look so bright and colorful under your Christmas tree. And it's such a welcome gift to anyone who enjoys a good smoke. Because you know, smoking enjoyment is all a matter of taste. And the fact of the matter is, Lucky's taste better. Cleaner, fresher, smoother. That's why you can't go wrong if you remember your friends with these colorful Christmas cartons of Lucky Strike. Be happy, go lucky for Christmas gifts this year. <laughs> For those of you who tuned in late, I'd just like to announce that uh, this was not the Robert Montgomery Theater. <laughs> but I did enjoy doing this television show very, very much because this is the first time that I've ever worked with Irene Dunn. It's also the first time that I've been able to understand Gregory Ratoff. <laughs> he sounds like a Russian Marlon Brando. Of course, like the... Um, the uh, Robert Montgomery Theater, I wanted to bring these movie stars out here just to take a bow and ask them what their future plans were. But uh, they told me it was none of my business. <laughs> and Vincent Price, too. I, you know, I think he's a fine actor and everything, but, uh, and, you know, I'm not jealous of his talent, but I don't know why he's so stuck up. You know, I saw him at a party the other night at Ronald Coleman's house, and I waved at him, and I whistled at him, and hollered at him, and everything. He wouldn't even turn around. So I just closed my window and went to bed. <laughs> well, anyway, so much for the show, and oh, oh, before I forget, I was asked to make an announcement. Uh, I want to welcome... Uh, a new uh, television station that opened this morning in Las Vegas. 
a CBS station in Las Vegas. So welcome, KF. Huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, oh. I'm, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. They've just lost it. <laughs> again very, very much. See you in about three weeks. Evans, Ralph Sedan, B. Benaderet, and Lois Kimbrell. Remember, one week from tonight on this same station, charming, disarming Ann Southern returns in her famous role as a not-too-private private secretary. You'll love watching Ann's hilarious adventures and misadventures. Tonight's Jack Benny program has been a film presentation brought to you by Lucky Strike, product of the American Tobacco Company, America's leading manufacturer of cigarettes. This is Don Wilson saying, be happy, go lucky. This is the CBS Television Network. Hello oh, again, this is Buck Benny speaking. We have a great double feature for you tonight. We had the Jack Benny show earlier from 70 years ago this week. And now we have Screen Guild Theater from the same night, 70 years ago this week. And uh, Jack referred to it on his show that he would be on Screen Guild. And this Screen Guild uh, show is written by uh, Bill Morrow and Ed Boyne, the regular writers for the Jack Benny show. And you can tell, I mean, it, it feels like a, a Benny script. And so it's a neat show to bring you. I, I love bringing the shows from exactly, you know, 70 years ago, 60 years ago. And when they mention something, uh, an appearance Jack's making or so forth, that I try and bring that to you as well. Uh, I think it uh, adds some context to both shows. So anyway, I hope you enjoy uh, tonight's show. Uh, I've, uh, both of them... Um, very funny tonight, very well done. Um, Bill Morrow and Ed Boulogne are just great writers, so uh, I hope you enjoy both shows. I was going to mention on the Jack Benny show, there's a reference to um, uh, Rochester says he's uh, um, black in the face over something, and I was thinking, that's one of the few times that you really hear uh, Rochester's um, race brought into the Jack Benny show. I mean, it happens every once in a while, but um, uh, not uh, that direct that often, but certainly uh, some of the episodes do that as well. So you can listen for that in the Jack Benny show that was on before this. And we will see you uh, tomorrow for some Fibber McGee and Molly and uh, some, perhaps some Fred Allen. I'm still trying to figure out what I'm doing with that. Uh, he skipped an episode, but... Uh, uh, we'll deal with that. So, see you tomorrow. Claudette Colbert, Edward Arnold, Basil Rathbone, Ernst Lubitsch, and maybe Jack Benny. <laughs> the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. <laughs> The director of the star's own theater, Roger Pryor. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of your neighborhood Good Gulf dealer and the Gulf Oil Companies, welcome to the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. For our guests tonight, we have Claudette Colbert, Edward Arnold, Basil Rathbone, and Ernst Lubitsch. Four of Filmdom's outstanding personalities who will offer... Well, say, just a minute, Roger. I, I thought Jack Benny was supposed to be one of the guests here tonight. Jack Benny? Well, he was, bud, but he got a little temperamental and hard to handle, so... Say, I wonder, could could he could he be mad at me? Uh, no, no, bud. I know the real story. Well, he could be. You know, I sent some photographers to his house. But Benny likes to have his picture taken. <laughs> 
that's it. They didn't take Benny's picture. They took Carmichael's Benny's polar bear. <laughs> oh, but why? Well, you see, the Gulf people were getting up a sign that said, Laugh at Winter, and they wanted Carmichael to pose for the picture of a big white polar bear on the sign. Well, that sounds okay to me. <laughs> but Jack insisted that they use pictures of him in a fur coat instead. <laughs> oh, now, now, Jack isn't the kind of a fellow to begrudge a polar bear a little publicity. A little publicity? Why, you'll see that laughing white polar bear sign outside every Gulf station in the country. And when you do see it, remember that winter is just around the corner. And that right now is not a minute too soon to prepare for winter. To change your motor oil for winter-grade Gulf Pride motor oil. Gulf Pride is the motor oil made by the famous Alclor process that only Gulf uses. Gulf Pride helps give you a quick starting motor and real engine protection, both when your motor is cold and after it warms up. Be sure to stop soon at the sign of the Gulf Orange Disc, where you see the picture of the laughing white bear for Gulf Pride motor oil. That was good advice, Bud. But now about Jack Benny. You see, Jack wanted to be on the show in the worst way, but we tried to explain to him that this season we're going to do a dramatic series and he just wouldn't fit in. We had an awful time convincing him. Well, I thought the Guild had asked Jack to appear in this broadcast. Oh, no, it's the other way around. We didn't ask him. He asked us. Well, Jack said that we... Uh, Philip, but it's, it's a long story. Now, let me explain the whole thing. Uh, when Jack found out that Ernst Lubitsch was going to direct Claudette Colbert and Basil Rathbone in a dramatic sketch, uh, right away he wanted to muscle in on it. So he called up Edward Arnold, president of the Screen Actors Guild, and tried to sell himself. The way I understand it, Arnold had an awful time convincing Jack. But look, Mr. Arnold, there's no reason why I shouldn't be on this show. Gee, when else will I get a chance to act with Claudette Colbert? Jack, I've been trying to explain to you that the play is all set and the cast is complete. Now, let me, let's make it some other time. Now, you don't have to beat around the bush, Mr. Arnold. Look, if you don't want me on this show, just tell me. All I want is a simple answer, yes or no. No. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> I can tell from your attitude, Mr. Arnold, that this is a personal matter. What have you got against me? I haven't got anything against you, Jack. But you're a comedian. And frankly, I don't think you have enough dramatic ability to play the lead opposite Miss Colbert. What do you mean I can't be dramatic? You ever see me when I was worried? <laughs> Why, I'm only 32 and I've got gray hair. You're only what? I've got gray hair, can't you hear <laughs> Now, look, Mr. Arnold, I'm not going to beg to be on this program, and let's get this settled one way or the other. Is it yes or no? Definitely no. Hmm. Well, who can I speak to besides you about this? <laughs> there must be somebody. Well, Jack, there's only one suggestion I can make. Get in touch with Ernst Lubitsch. He's going to direct the play. Gee, Lubitsch. And if it's all right with him, it's all right with me. Well, thanks, thanks. I'll call him right away. By the way, what's Mr. Lubitsch's telephone number? Ulrich, 8900. Wait till I write it down. Ulrich. Hey, that's the number you call to get the correct time. Now, look, Mr. Arnold. Hello? Hello? Operator, I was cut off. That's what you think, kid. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Fine president of the Screen Actors Guild. I got a good mind to run against him. Well, let's see, where can I get Lubitsch's number? Oh, here's a telephone book right here. No. Uh, no, miss. I want to talk to Mr. Lubitsch personally. Who's calling, please? Uh, Benny. Jack Benny. Yes, sir. Is it about insurance or something? No, it's about acting. Now, please, have Mr. Lubitsch come to the phone. Do you think he will? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> Ask him. Yes, sir. Insurance yet. I haven't sold a policy since Paramount picked up my option. <laughs> In the first... Hello? Hello, Mr. Lubitsch? This is... Oh, he's not there yet. What's the matter with me, anyway? Hello? Do you think that I... Oh, hello? Hello, Mr. Lubitsch? This is Jack. I'm calling you about that golf show you're directing next week, and I was wondering if there was a part in it for me. Jack who? Oh, pardon me. Benny. Jack Benny. Remember, we met once at a party at Barbara Stanwyck's house. Yes? You know, the girl that's married to Robert Taylor. Well, I know her, and I know him. But who are you? I'm Benny, Jack Benny. Oh, the radio comedian, uh-huh. Hooray, I sunk in. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's the situation, Mr. Lubitsch. I just spoke to Edward Arnold, president of the Screen Actors Guild, whom, incidentally, I'm running against next year. And Mr. Arnold said if it was okay with you, I could be on the program. 
But, Mr. Benny, this is a serious, dramatic play, and I'm afraid there is no part in it for you. But why not? Well, you are a comedian. What can I do with you in the drama? Look, Mr. Lubitsch, if you can make Garbo laugh, you can make me cry. <laughs> well, I can do drama. Gee, I made a picture once called College Holiday. I didn't get one laugh in it. <laughs> now, what do you say? I'm glad I didn't see it. <laughs> Very funny. Now, Mr. Lubitsch, let's not beat around the bush. I want a definite answer. Is it yes or no? Brace yourself. <laughs> Now, Mr. Lubitsch, I know I haven't given you enough time to think this over, so I'll call you back later. Now, and... wait a minute, Jack. There is no use taking up each other's time. Basel Ratbun is playing opposite to that Kolber, and there's nothing I can do about it. Well, why can't we make it a triangle? Why can't he be her husband and I her lover? Who would believe that? <laughs> Plenty of people. It can be worked out. Don't worry. Now, well, Jack, I'm very busy right now. Call up Miss Colbert, and if it's all right with her, it's okay with me. Thank you. I'll do that. Oh, what's Miss Colbert's telephone number? Ulrich! Never mind. I'll get it myself. <laughs> Goodbye. Some director. Really tried to get me in a picture sometime. Oh, well. Now, let's see. Colbert. Colbert. Oh, uh, Miss Colbert isn't home right now, eh? Do you know where I can reach her? You might telephone Westmore's beauty parlor in Hollywood. I'm quite sure you can get her there. Uh, thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> Hello, Westmore Brothers? Uh, this is Jack Benny. Sorry, Mr. Benny. Your toupee isn't ready yet. <laughs> I don't want my toupee. I'd like to speak to Claudette Colbert. Is she there? I don't know. Hey, Wally, is Claudette Colbert here? I don't know. Hey, Purge, is Claudette Colbert here? I don't know. Hey, say! Never mind. Let her go. I'll wait till she gets home. <laughs> hello? I'd like to speak to Miss Colbert, please. This is Colbert speaking. Oh, hello, Claudette. Uh, guess who this is? Well, really, I haven't the slightest idea. Oh, come on, yes. Oh, now, look. L uh, look, look, Claudette. Who has the dressing room next to yours at Paramount? Oh, hello, Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> Dorothy, I'm not Lamour. Look, Dorothy's dressing room is on one side of you. Now, who's on the other side? That's a washroom. Only part of it. <laughs> Claudette, look, this is Jack Benny. Oh, hello, Jack. Hello. Look, Jack, I, I haven't decided yet about those Christmas cards, but if you'll call a little later... <laughs> it's not the Christmas cards. There's no rush on them. Uh, listen, Claudette, I called you up to tell you that I saw Boomtown the other night, and I want to congratulate you on your grand performance. Oh, thanks, Jack. You were really marvelous. I thought your characterization, your sincerity, and your emotional qualities in Boomtown surpassed anything I have ever seen on the screen. Well, that's more oil than there was in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm serious, Claudette. It was a great performance. Now, let's see. There was something else I wanted to speak to you about. Oh, yes. Yeah, look, Claudette. And uh, Mr. Lubitsch suggested I call you about the golf show next Sunday. Yes? Have you any objection to my playing the part of your husband in the sketch? Oh, well, I understood that the rest was playing the part. Well, he was scheduled to, but if you want me, all you've got to do is speak up. <laughs> I said, all you've got to do is speak up. Claudette, are you there? Yes. Oh, oh. <laughs> I wish you'd think this over because it would really be a wonderful break for both of us. Yeah, especially me. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Let's say it'll do us both a lot of good, shall we? Would you mind hanging up? Now, wait a minute, Claudette. <laughs> how, uh, how about the, how about the idea? <laughs> Honestly, Jack, I really have nothing to do with it. Why don't you call Edward Arnold, president of the Screen Actors Guild? 
He won't be next year. <laughs> call him, and it's up to you. Now, look, Claudette, I've got another idea. Why can't I... Will you please deposit five cents for an additional three minutes? Three minutes already? Just a second. Would you mind dropping a nickel in, Claudette? <laughs> Jack, I don't have a pay phone in my house. Oh, well, that's right. What am I thinking of? Do I get that nickel, or do I have to cut you off? Now, don't get excited. <laughs> Here, I found one. There. Hmm. No more three minutes than the man in the moon. <laughs> Doesn't seem like we've been talking for three minutes, does it, Claudette? You ought to be on this end. <laughs> <laughs> well, to come to the point, Claudette, here's what I was going to ask you. Uh, when do you start rehearsing for the play? Tomorrow night at my house, but, Jack, I don't think you At ought... your house, eh? What time? Eight o'clock, but really, Jack, I don't eight think you ought to... Eight o'clock. Well, thanks, Claudette. See you tomorrow night. I'll read the part, and Rathbone will read the part, and may the best man win. That's fair enough, isn't it? Kind of sticking your chin out, aren't you, Junior? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Well, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, by the way, Claudette, shall I come for dinner? Hmm. Oh, well, some other time. <laughs> While Jack is on his way to Claudette Colbert's house, here's Frank Tours conducting Oscar Bradley's Gulf Orchestra in the Continental, Frank's own special arrangement. Anyway, Bud, the next night, about 7.30, Jack showed up at Claudette Colbert's house. I wasn't there, of course, but the way I understand it, when Jack arrived, Miss Colbert was still having dinner. So the butler opened the door and... Right this way, Mr. Benny. I'll show you into the drawing room. Well, thanks. Thanks. Mr. Rathbone is here already. Oh, he is. One of those anxious guys, eh? <laughs> Say, this is a lovely home. Lovely. May I take your umbrella, Mr. Benny? Oh, yes. Yes, I... <laughs> I uh, should have left it out in the hall. You know, it looked like rain. <laughs> well, well, Mr. Rathbone, I'm Jack Benny, the movie star. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> so the uh, two rivals meet, eh? Rivals? What do you mean? Well, perhaps I should let Claudette tell you, but it looks like uh, I'm taking your place on the golf show next Sunday. Oh, that's ridiculous, old boy. Oh, no, no, it isn't. You see, at rehearsal tonight, you and I are both going to read the part. And, of course, the best man will win. The best man? Yes. Uh, Mr. Benny, when only two people are involved in a statement, the comparative is used. You don't say the best man will win. You say the better man will win. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, if three or more people are involved, then the word best is the correct adjective. I see. So before we compete for this part, Mr. Benny, it might be as well if you first learned how to speak English. Hmm. <laughs> well, thanks for the lesson, Madam Lazanga. 
For your information, Mr. Rathbone, I went to Waukegan High School four years, and I excelled in English. In fact, I got 99 every single term. Ain't that interesting? <laughs> Getting back to the subject, the way the script is written now, uh, you play the part of Miss Colbert's husband. Is that correct? That's correct and final. That <laughs> remains to be seen. Hmm. I've heard of sore losers in my life, but this guy certainly takes the case. Step right in here, Mr. Lubitsch. Miss Colbert will be with you shortly. Thank you. Oh, hello, Barson. And still, boy, how are you? Fine, fine. Uh, hello, Mr. Lubitsch. What are you doing here? Well, I thought I'd just drop around to see... Now, if... listen, Ernst. I don't know what this is all about. I demand an explanation. Look, Mr. Rathbone. Explanation? Look, Mr. Lubin. I thought I was to appear opposite Miss Colbert. Look, Mr. Rathbone. Of course you were. Look, Mr. Lubin. Then what is all this about? Look, Mr. Rathbone. Now, look! Mr. <laughs> Mr. Benny, when I spoke to you on the telephone, I thought I made it perfectly clear that... Good evening, everybody. Oh, look, here's Claudette. Oh, hello, hello. Claudette. Yeah. Well, here we are. Put the coffee down here, Richard. Yes, for that. Can we talk to Mr. No, thank you. Coffee, Basil? Yeah, uh, here, please, yeah. I'll have some, too. Oh, here you are, Jack. Thank you. Mmm. Gee, Claudette, this is the better coffee I ever tasted. <laughs> Mr. Benny. Yes? The word is best. There are only two of us drinking it. <laughs> Make up your mind. Well, we're all here, so let's get started with the rehearsal. Now, just one moment. Ernst, let's get this settled uh, for Mr. Benny's benefit, shall we? Is he or is he not replacing me in the play? Certainly not. That's ridiculous. Of course it's ridiculous. Why, it's absurd. You stay out of it. <laughs> the butler, yes. Then, Mr. Benny, I'd like to know why you said that Mr. Lubitsch recommended the change. I didn't say that. I said that Miss Colbert suggested it. I suggested nothing of the kind. But Claudette! Please, please, stop oh. all this bickering. Now, Jack, if you like to watch the rehearsal, take a chair and be quiet. Yes, sir. Oh, Claudette, is it all right if I have some of these walnuts here? Go right ahead. Help yourself, Jack. Thank you. Mmm. <laughs> Big one. <laughs> Now, Claudette, you too, Basil. If you both turn to page 12 in the script, we will proceed. Boy, these nuts are good. Now, Claudette, you are a wealthy society girl who is married to a New York stockbroker. That's you, Basil. Jeez. But he does not love you, Claudette. And as the French say, it is a marriage of convenience. <laughs> Hey, that was a tough one. <laughs> Mr. Benny, will you stop eating those nuts? Well, Claudette said I could. <laughs> anyway, Mr. Lubitsch, I don't want to sit around here like a bump on a log. If I can't have the lead in the play, isn't there something I can do? All right, all right. If it makes you happy, you can play the part of the butler. The butler? Okay. Here's your script. Thanks. Now, remember, Claudette, you are the wife. Basil, you are the husband who doesn't understand that. And Jack, I'm the butler whom Claudette really loves. You are the butler, that's all. <laughs> okay, okay. Heavens to Betsy. <laughs> all right, Claudette, now we start the scene. Remember, your husband is two hours late for dinner, and you are a nervous wreck. Yes, Mr. Lewis, I understand. Go ahead, call the butler. Yes. <clears throat> oh, it's Medley. Medley. Yes, madame. Medley, yes. Uh, what is it, madame? Are you sure my husband hasn't phoned? No, madame. But I can't understand it. What time is it, Medley? It's half past eight. Shall I serve dinner, madame? No, no, Medley. I'm not too upset to eat. I think I'll go to a movie. What's playing in the village? Buck Benny rides again. That's not in the script. Read the lines, please. <laughs> well, it doesn't hurt to give my picture a plug. It doesn't change the plot any, does it? For heaven's sake. Read the way it's written. All right, all right. Give me that again, again, Claudette. Okay. <clears throat> no, Smedley. I'm much too upset to eat. I think I'll go to a movie. What's playing in the village? Nanotchka. How's that? Much better. <laughs> and Buck Benny rides again. It's a double feature. <laughs> yeah. Jack, please. All right, I'll start over again. Shall I serve dinner, madame? 
<clears throat> no, Sedley, I'm much too upset to eat. I think I'll go to a movie. It's Boomtown playing in the village. <laughs> well, we got them all in. <laughs> Very good, Claudette. Now, at this point, the husband enters the room. Not ready, hon. Oh, Mr. Lubert, let me ask you something. When Basil comes in, or Basil... By the way, how do you pronounce that? Basil or Basil? Mr. Rathbone. Oh. <laughs> well, when Mr. Rathbone comes oh, in... Oh, just read the lines, Jack. I handle the rest. All right, all right. A fine director. What did you say? I said you're a fine director. I think you're wonderful. <laughs> Basil, make your entrance. I don't. Oh, good evening, darling. So sorry I'm late. Oh, Ronald, you're always late, and you're always sorry. It's been like this for months. What's come between us? If I only knew, maybe we could work things out. It's nothing, my dear. It's just that I've been so busy lately at the office. Let's forget it. Dinner is served. Oh, pardon me, I'm too soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ronald, I can't forget it. We must come to some understanding. This can't go on forever. Uh, Gwen, let's be adult about the whole thing, shall we? Every night it's the same argument, this constant nagging, nagging, nagging. I tell you, I've been working at the office. But I phoned your office and they said you left at two this afternoon. Well, I have business at the bank. And besides, I forgot where I parked my car. Find Sherlock Holmes can't even find his car. <laughs> Jack, stop interrupting, please. Right. Continue, Pluto. Uh, oh, it's no use, Ronald. I know you're lying. Look at you. Everything you say, everything you do gives you away. Now, Gwen. What's that on your collar? Is it lipstick? It ain't ketchup. <laughs> Please. Well, I don't want to stand around here like a dope. But you've got the line right now. Say it. Oh, yes. Uh, beg pardon, madame. The dinner is served. Jack, Jack, don't use such a thick accent. You should talk. <laughs> Pardon the job. A dinner is served. Now, 